messages. If you haven't done so already, please download the handout. Over in the right-hand tab, you'll see Active Literacy Strategies Handout. It is large. It has lots of pages to it because I wanted to give you as much as I could, um, as far as ready-to-go strategies and the handouts to go with them, we'll go over what's in that packet, but I definitely want you to have that copy in front of you and have it um, after today as well. So I'm the president of Reflective Learning and have been leading webinars um, for several years in the, in the areas of reading, writing, and science, just instructional practice in general, and bringing the Common Core standards to life as well. You can see some of them, my archived webinars on this screen. These are all on the CTE website for you. Some of these were, were done last year, some of these were this year's information, but all of these are connected in some form or fashion to today's session on literacy as well. Today, we're just talking about those engaging active literacy strategies that you can um, use without a whole lot of planning, but that will help the students break down any type of text that you place in front of them. Uh, these strategies that I have chosen for today are really great for nonfiction, and I know that's the majority of the content that you cover, so I tried to focus on those. Just before we get started, let me walk you through a couple places on the nycetecenter.org website. This is where you will find just a wealth of information after today, including this archived webinar. Under the resource link, you are going to, to find um, some surveys online materials and tools that go along with rigor that we're going to discuss. You're also going to find these webinars posted. You will see a list of some of the past webinars here. Under the instruction link, when you are there, you are going to find a PDF of a ton of literacy strategies. Some I will talk about today, but honestly, a lot of the ones in that link I tried to leave out of today's conversation just so that you have additional ones um, after today. You also have um, there the literacy database. That database includes fiction and nonfiction text that can go along with topics in CTE. So you can search a topic and get a list of articles or books that might go along with what you are teaching, um, as well as the reading level. And then under the professional learning part, you're going to get access to some facilitation guides. If you are on the call as a leader or a team leader um, or an administrator, you might want to check out some of those facilitation guides. We, they are just complete units that you can do in a short amount of time to help your staff understand uh, some of the topics that we discuss in our webinars. Um, and I shared that one as well. Okay, time for our first poll. This and Gretchen, if you will launch this, just to let me know who my audience is. Can you please let me know your position? And I'll give you just a second, Gretchen, if you want to explain how they um, answer that. Uh, yep, yeah, sure. A screen should pop up in front of you on your your computer or tablet or whatever device you're using, and you just select your your option and submit it, and then I will share the results in a few moments. <clears throat> okay, everybody's participated, so I'm going to share this now. Oh, great. So we have a lot of teachers that are always I wonder about the other, but I'm going to assume that those are other leaders in the building and um, we, or maybe consultants as well. So we will uh, proceed from there. But I am tickled to death that we have that many teachers on the call because this webinar is truly more for you than anyone else. So let's um, 
talk about our objectives today. We're just going to spend a little bit of time talking about the connection between reading and writing, look at some reading best practices and talk through those, and then spend the majority of time on those literacy strategies and actually um, giving you handouts for those, explaining how to use those, explaining when to use those and why to use those. So why do we focus on literacy? You know, it's, it's just common sense that it's important, but we also have some research to back us up in this part. And this research here, if you are on the call as a leader, um, this is research that I think should be shared with all of your students before they register for classes, quite frankly. When I was a high school administrator, we tried to share some of this college and career data with our students and our parents before students registered for the, those classes. And um, if you're on the call as a teacher, I think this sh should be shared in your parent information as well because it helps parents understand why you are including reading and literacy strategies into these courses that are typically heavily hands-on. So the reading levels that are required or our entry level jobs are well above those of the high school student. And if you actually look at the data, the entry level um, reading levels of, of jobs is actually higher than those going to college as well. And the main reason for that is that students don't have support after they leave. They are expected to know how to read, write, going into the job. Um, this text is typically heavy in academic language, and um, nonfiction text is naturally a grade level um, higher than non than fictional text, and it's it's more difficult for students to read. So they lose the support, and the reading level is higher. Seventy-two percent of our employers rate high school graduates as deficient in basic writing skills, and I don't think there'd be anybody who disagreed with that based on the coaching that I have done in schools. We always wish that our students were better writers for the most part. 38% of our graduates are deficient in simple reading comprehension. And all of that literacy data is linked to our labor force. It's linked to how much they make. It's linked to who votes, who volunteers. It's linked to how many we support on public assistance and how many are incarcerated. So it, it is important for the student. It's important for our society that we have strong um, readers. So I want you to think about your own courses and your own school. And look at these questions here. I'm sorry, clicked off of that. How many students are struggling with reading? How many are struggling with writing? And how do you, in your CTE courses, help with that? How do you help them with the material? How do you help them, um, if you can't alter the material, how do you help them understand the material that you place in front of them that they have to read? Those are the questions that I, I hope that you will consider as we go through today's webinar. Okay, for the next poll question, I'll ask Gretchen to launch this. The Rigor and Relevance Framework is linked to, to the work of the International Center for Leadership and Education, New York CTE Center as well. So give me an idea of your understanding of this framework. It's okay if you are just beginning. I'm, in your understanding, I just need to know how fast to go through these next slides. Okay, so we are altering between novice and um, proficient, about half in each area. So let me just talk just a minute about this then. The Rigor and Relevance Framework is divided into four quadrants, A, B, C, and D. There is no bad quadrant. Each quadrant is needed in the classroom. So that is one thing that I want to make very clear is that if um, I were to walk into your classroom to observe your teaching and you were teaching in quadrant A, that does not mean bad instruction. If we don't move out of quadrant A, then we have an issue. Quadrant D 
is um, where students are doing the majority of the thinking and the work, and that's where we strive to get students during the day. But you are probably going to go through all of these quadrants um, throughout your instruction. We hope that um, we can think about this in terms of literacy and that connection to literacy, and that's what I want to bring out today. So when we look at the rigor and relevance framework on the left-hand side, we have the rigor piece, and it's connected to blooms. You can connect it to depth of knowledge if your school uses the okay. But for today's purposes, I have connected it to blooms, where the bottom level is knowledge, and we run up all the way to the top of analysis, synthesis, evaluation. We hope that we get students reading, analyzing text, synthesizing text, evaluating text so that they can use it and adapt that adapt what they do in the real world based on that. If we go along the bottom spectrum, well, I, sorry, the slide is showing you the high and the low of the quadrants. If we go along the bottom se section, we have the relevance, and that is if we move from quadrant A over to quadrant B, we are moving across disciplines. So quadrant A and C information is knowledge in one discipline. If we move over to quadrant uh, B and D, we are applying skills across disciplines. I will be honest with you, most of the time in the CTE classes, we are in, um, we are using information that can be applied across disciplines, um, more so than sometimes in some other courses. So let's real quickly go through the quadrants, and this is just framing our understanding of this so we can think about the literacy strategies that I've chosen and why I've chosen these. The literacy strategies that I have chosen for you move out of quadrant A and just um, out of that regurgitation of information, and uh, it's so that we can get students to do more of the thinking. So in quadrant A, students are just gathering bits of pieces of information. This is information that is basically recall. It might be a definition. It might be a fact. But it doesn't matter if it's easy or hard. If it is one answer and you know that that is the answer and you're looking for students to give you that one answer, then it's quadrant A. This is lower levels of thinking. And um, it is necessary at times, but we do want to move students away from just regurgitation of information. So if we give students three plus three, that's quadrant A. If we give them three plus three divided by six squared, um, multiplied by 12, that's still quadrant A, one answer that we are looking for. Low levels of thinking, low levels of application, just regurgitation of information. In quadrant A, the teacher is doing the majority of the work, quite frankly, like what I am doing right now, just sharing information and audience being expected to retain that. If we move over to quadrant B, then students do begin to apply some of that knowledge to solve problems and complete work. Um, in quadrant B, they might be following directions for something that you gave them, such as if you wanted them to make an electrical circuit, you gave them in the instructions for that. They would read those instructions and do just as the directions said. That's quadrant B. It still has the lower level of thinking because you have outlined exactly what they are to do. Not that they can't mess that up, but those instructions are there. And uh, but it's a higher level of application. They're actually getting to do something with the information. Again, sometimes this is necessary for them to understand a skill, but we don't want to keep them here. We want to make them problem solvers. So here the students are doing some of the work, but you have still done the majority of the thinking in that activity. We want to try to move some of our reading from that lower level of quadrant A and B up to that higher level of C and D. So in C, students are using high levels of thinking and knowledge to analyze a problem or a situation. 
um, using information that provided or information that they found. They might be comparing two articles. They might be com comparing a video um, with an interview, with an article. They might be comparing three articles. They might be comparing two different viewpoints of how to fix something or, or how to market something and then coming up with their own ideas based on that. So students are doing a higher level of thinking here, but low levels of application. So they're not really doing anything with that information. If they were looking at um, two marketing plans and deciding which one was best, and that was the end of the activity, then that is quadrant C, but um, if they were to do something with that information and move it across disciplines, then that could move over to quadrant D. The students are doing a high level of thinking in quadrant C, but it's still staying in that one discipline. And then quadrant B is where the teacher becomes the facilitator of the classroom and the students are doing the majority of the thinking and the work. And we hope that with our reading and writing activities that we give students that we can get them to this point, that they're thinking about um, what they are reading and understanding how to apply that information to unpredictable situations. So um, this would be where they might design a marketing plan, present it to somebody in the business world, or um, they might design brochures for local businesses. Um, the school that I worked with this week, they were talking about designing brochures for businesses, taking them to that business and letting, letting the businesses pick which design they would use and then come back and utilize that. The, they were um, making videos for school announcements that the uh, groups that they were making for were able to choose which one that they wanted. So they were following a, a protocol, but the um, end result was unpredictable to the teacher. There's high levels of thinking here, high levels of application, students doing the majority of the thinking and the work, and the teacher is there as a guide. Hopefully the majority of the activities that I have given you today for literacy fit into this because in teaching, I think we have to focus on helping students know how to learn versus just giving them what to learn. So teaching them um, where to, to get information, how to get information. If you were to disappear tomorrow as their instructor, would they be able to carry on? Would they know where to get information and how to learn? So let's move on um, to talk about the reading instruction a little bit deeper. And um, I just want to know your thoughts here on your reading instruction. Um, I'm giving you some pointers here or, your, or statements here. If you will, take a moment to read through those and then I'm gonna ask Gretchen to launch and the poll so that, she, that you can give me your feedback on that. Okay, if you will submit your answer here, and I know Gretchen has abbreviated them just slightly to fit in our poll format. Okay, so we are, looks like we do incorporate it on a regular basis and that students are still struggling with that comprehension piece. So good in terms, of not good that students are struggling with the comprehension piece, but good because I think the majority of the strategies that I have um, will help you with that today and even and as you look further at the strategies on the 
NYCD website, you will see others as well. So as I thought about which strategies to give you today, I, I thought about what is it that students really need from us in terms of literacy. And if we look at some of the ACTE website um, research, we'll see that um, the top three skills that students report gaining from their CTE classes, one of those being real world examples, one of them being working as a team, and um, then the skills to get them to the future job. I try to incorporate these also into our reading strategies. We want to make sure that the material we are giving students has a true purpose. I want you to think about that material that, that you hand to your students to read. I can't answer this question for you without um, the coaching piece, but this is something that if I coach schools in the area of literacy, we will talk through. And the question I ask is, the information you give to students, would you have been interested in reading it when you were in high school? As adults, we might have a higher tolerance for some um, academic language or heavier academic language that um, is not as interesting as we would have when compared to our, our high school experience. So think about the reading material you're giving students. Is it interesting? Is it truly from the field? Is it something that as a high school student you would want to read? If not, then how can you alter that and still stay true to what students need when they leave your classroom. The other thing that we want to make sure that we do for our students is model, model, model. And, and that is model how to read these complex texts, and model how to break it down, model the thinking that you are doing as you read something, and, and the, the questions that you ask yourself, how you retain the information, how you know it's a good article or a good place to get information, and then ask good questions. Make sure your activities to go along with um, the material are in those higher quadrants. Make sure uh, that's relevant to students. Make sure it's engaging to students so that you are doing your very best to keep them um, interested in learning. On, in your handouts on page seven, if you notice um, on these slides that's in the top right hand corner on these next slides that I go over, there will be a page number that correlates to your handout. So on page seven, I have given you sample questions to go along with the levels of rigor. And I want you to consider those in um, this next activity that we do. So starting out, you have knowledge questions. These are your lower level rigor questions. But the, these question stems are ones that you can use when creating questions to go along with any type of reading material. Then um, you move to comprehension, application. You, again, you have all of these in your handout. And I want you to refer to these here in just a moment for the activity. Then we move up to the, the questions for your level C and D, where we have analysis questions, and evaluation and synthesis questions. So these are that you can utilize um, to help students answer higher level rigor questions. And I would be honest with you, I've seen teachers actually make copies of these for the students as well and ask them to ask each other higher level rigor questions in their com academic conversations with each other. The, the same tool is available, your question stems by quadrant, um, and that is something that the International Center for Leadership and Education has published as well. So in thinking about that, the, the need for the higher level of rigor, I want you to look at these five examples of things that you could ask students about a text. And just jot down on a, a little scrap sheet of paper which ones of these are higher levels of rigor 
and then which ones are low riggers. High rigger, low rigger, I'll be quiet so you can look at them in just a second. I'll ask Gretchen to launch the poll so that I can see your understanding. But try to look back at those sample question stems and see if you can decide which ones of these are high rigger and low rigger. You go ahead and enter your answer. Hopefully you were able to read those all. Okay, so we have 67% of our participants say B, C, and D, and 33% say C and D. Let's look at these. So we have no one chose the first one um, as high rigor, and that is correct. It's just how many steps. So they really do not even have to read the article to answer that one. And no one said um, the last one either. In what paragraph? would you locate information about antibacterial soaps? Again, they can skim probably to get that. So that one definitely is low level rigor. Now, it's okay to include a few of those questions like that in to your questions with students if you need to. However, make sure the majority of the questions that you ask students are at least at the application level or above. Um, typically, you're going to hit the OK two or three if you do that, if your state uses uh, the OK, or um, if you use the Blooms and the application synthesis evaluation uh, level. So let's look at B, because B is the, the one that's the difference between the two answers. Uh, B, actually, I put in here as a trick question because it can be high level rigor or low level rigor depending on the article. So um, ACT will typically will use this type of questioning a lot to see if students understand meanings of words. They might have um, the word coolant in the article or they might and it and it be very clear about um, what that word means or it may not be clear in the article and students have to use inferencing skills to answer what the word means. So in order to really know if that is high level rigor or not, you would need the article to go with it. To look at the article to say, what level of understanding do students have to know to answer that question? If the article and makes those vocabulary words bold, and right after the bold part is the definition of the word, then that's low rigor. If, however, the word is in there, but the definition is not in there, and students have to use information around that paragraph to form a definition of their own, then that is actually higher level of rigor. And everyone had C and D, as, as higher levels rigor, and you are correct in that. So it is how they um, utilize vocabulary in the article, and I wanted to throw that one in there, there because this one is on a lot of state tests, that question B, that type of question, where students have to use um, inferencing skills to find synonyms or antonyms or definitions of words that 
are that they have to actually apply the definition versus just knowing the definition. Good job on that. All right, now the fun part. Let's get into some literacy strategies. So I have listed several here. I tried to pick some older ones, some newer ones. And what I want you to do is just uh, right now, real quickly, read through those. These are all ones that I hope we can talk about the majority of these today. You have um, the majority of these in your handout. Right now, just think about how many of these you are familiar with and jot that down on your scrap sheet of paper, and then I'm going to ask Gretchen to launch our next poll. How many of these literacy strategies are you familiar with? How many of these are you utilizing? And if you will, answer that in our poll. Oh, good. So we have um, the majority of you, 80%, only using a few of these strategies. So that's great because that tells me I'm going to be able to give you some new ones today. Awesome. Wonderful. Okay, so let's talk about them. I've tried to put a slide in here um, about each one of them so that you will know what they are, how to use them, and also in your handouts, a lot of them have explanations. I also want to reference this book and I uh, will put a disclaimer in here that my friends have written this book, Denise White and Melissa Braden. They, this is an excellent book on instructional strategies. Some of these fit right in with our literacy strategies that we're going to talk about today. I did not pull from these today, but if you want some more go-to strategies, these are easy ones that get your students actively engaged in instruction of any type, but definitely into the literacy um, strategies. And it's just jam packed with lots of different strategies that I did not pull from today. So that's an additional resource for you. Okay, chunking, let's talk about that. Hopefully this is one that you do utilize. This is a, definitely an oldie, but we want to make sure that um, we talk about how can we chunk information when we're having students read. Sometimes we do this with our lecture um, more often than we do when students read articles. And I think this is one of the easiest strategies to implement and also one of the most effective, quite frankly, because this is what good readers do. You as a teacher will take whatever article they are reading. If it's in a textbook, then they might just put a post-it note um, instead of drawing the lines. But you, you basically divide up the text so students have points where they have to stop and process. So you will take the, the text and draw lines in the article. And, and then at the first line, you might put a one. Second line, put a two. And then when students um, reach that point, they pause and either answer a question or they summarize that information. How that helps you as a teacher is as they are reading that article, you can walk around and actually see if they are understanding what they read before they get to the end of the article and say, I don't understand anything I read. So um, here's an article that I just pulled up on GM cars with no steering wheels. Uh, from how stuff works. If you were taking this article, you would just literally draw a line in the article and then um, you might put a number one here and ask students, when you reach this point in the article, I want you to write a one sentence, a two sentence summary, real short, brief summary of the most important information in that section without copying it. It needs to be in their own words so that you can tell that they're synthesizing that information. That helps you understand if they're comprehending that. They can, you can have it to where 
um, you have them in teams and say, when everybody reaches that point, stop, do your two sentences, turn to your reading partner or your reading group, give them your summary, let them give you your, their summary, see if you're on the same track before moving on to the next chunk of text. It just helps with processing. It helps students um, to know what information is the most important. And it also helps them so that they don't have to keep trying to remember all the text. Uh, they are writing those most important parts down and then mentally being able to dump that information and move on to some other information. Those stopping points are also good for you as a teacher to say, okay, read to the first line, stop, let's talk about what you just read, then read to the second line, stop, let's talk about what you just read. Again, you're breaking down the text, helping them to chunk that information. The next um, strategy is called Jigsaw, and Jigsaw is where they divide up the article and read different sections of it. You can provide, um, students can provide information from which sec section they read, and then you give them a chance to share out the information. In your handout, you should have a jigsaw sheet that looks like this that you can just print out and use with your students. It's meant to go with any text, and they can write down important facts, or if you want them to just summarize different sections, then you um, can have them do that as well. And then it has an, a section where they can also pull in the information from their other group members on the other parts, and then write their summary of the article. So that's another way of um, dividing up a text, but in this strategy, students do not read the whole text. They just read a certain section and become an expert in that one section. Usually they will need to read that more than one time to be considered an expert, so you will give them that additional time um, to study that one part of the text for chunking um, they actually read the entire text. I found as a teacher that sometimes we could jigsaw, sometimes we couldn't, depending on the text, because it just didn't make sense always for them just to read one section. Um, and I didn't feel like they gained enough from that student conversation. Other text it worked fine with, so um, use that at your discretion. And But it does help with that teamwork piece, and it does help and then feel like they're um, not reading this much and they're able to just focus on a little bit of the text. And bounce cards are found on page 10 of your handout. Bounce cards are a great way to help with a conversation about a text. And um, what I have found in working and coaching in some of the classrooms that I work with is that Students struggle sometimes to have conversation about the text that they read. They, they struggle to know what kinds of questions to ask each other. So again, I go back to those question stems. I'm seeing teachers and um, give students some of those question stems. Bounce cards are another thing that you can do for them. So in your handout, you have a copy of um, bounce card questions. It's just a little bookmark that you can print and give students a, as a reference point. You can say, um, start with these question stems as you talk about the text. You might tell them which question stems to start with. You might give them the option of um, which question stems to use. But these are a great way to promote student-to-student -student conversation about a text. And you can use these. Um, like if you do the chunking of text and you give them those stopping points, then you can use these with that strategy and at those stopping points so students can talk about those. Trade of thought is on page 11 of your handout. And trade of thought is something that begins as a quiet strategy. And after it's an after reading strategy. So students um, read the text, but then you give them a question or a prompt about the text related to the text. You can really give them that question before they read uh, to help them to know 
what to look for as they're reading. And after they get that prompt, then they're going to silently, silently write down their own answer. Then you give them time to ask their um, classmates their response to that answer. So, um, oh, I, sorry, but I forgot to put the handout that goes with it. They, they have a, in your handout, you have a, um, a trade of thought worksheet where students go around the room and actually gather the thoughts of others, and then they come up with a final answer. That does not work well with low-level rigor questions. You want to make it something higher-level rigor, and it actually works great if they have two or three different articles to where they're pulling in information from different viewpoints. Boards up, this one is not in your handout because it doesn't need an actual um, worksheet to go with it. But this is where you give students certain questions or prompts and you they have a whiteboard in front of them to write the answer down. They don't show their answer um, until you say boards up and at that time everybody shows their answer at one time. So um, those little whiteboards are very cheap to buy but I've also seen teachers make their own out of laminated construction paper and erasable markers. What I love about the boards up strategy is it very quickly tells you as a teacher if the students are understanding the information that they read and you can very quickly glance around the room and say yes everybody got that one correct or no we're not understanding the text. Again this can be used with the chunking to where you give students a prompt in the first section and say stop Put your, question, put your answer on your board at the end of section one, and then give students time to write their answer and everybody shows it. Now let's move on and read the second section of the text. Here's the question, go with this. So you're chunking it and um, getting those questions, but students really like the boards. They're um, more apt to write better answers on theirs sometimes than they are on their own paper. Uh, you can have them do this in pairs. You can have a group share their best answer. But it's what I like about everybody having their own board is that you have everybody accountable for the answer. Raft is in your handouts and it is on page 12. Raft is a strategy and that is often used in ELA classrooms, but I've seen it in the CTE classrooms be successful in terms of students having to think about the role of a business leader. So the strategy of RAF, um, RAF is the role of the writer, audience, format, topic. That's where RAF comes from. The students are given an article but then they write about the article based on um, a different role. So they might take on the role of the business leader. They might take on the role of the client. They might take on the role um, of an administrator or a team leader and see it through a, a different eye. And, see the problem through a different eye. So let's say we're working on a car and you give them um, an article about how to fix this car. Then one of the roles that you might give them is the client. What would the client need to consider when they're fixing this car? And what information in the article would be useful for them? It, then the actual mechanic, they might write from the mechanic mechanics view, what information the article would be important to the mechanic. So they just take on a different role, consider their, their audience, and write in various formats on the topic given. Many teachers talk to me about students needing help with vocabulary. So I put a strategy in here for vocabulary, and this is found on page 15 of your handout. MVP, it's called, or My Vocabulary Progress. And um, 
it's a pretty simple strategy as far as implementation goes. It helps students to keep track of their words um, and the words that they are learning, which is one of and Marzano's top strategies for retention of information is helping students track their own learning. So you will ask students, and for, to use a strategy, you will ask students to record focus words that they would like to study. Now, that's where it gets tricky with students because some students might say, I don't want to study any words, and you, you might have to help them along with that. Um, you might need to have a conversation about what words regarding this topic would be most beneficial to you if you were um, to, to really go into this field, and those might be the words that students choose, but hopefully they get some choice. It might be that you write a list of words on the board and they can choose six of the ten that they want to study, or five of the nine that they want to study, but hopefully there's some choice so that they do not have to study words that they already know. That's the goal of this, is that they can actually push themselves forward um, and focus on words that they do not know. You have them write the word down and the meaning in their own word, uh, in their own words. And then as they are reading the text, then they should be able to tell you where they found the word. And after they read, the, they either draw a picture, write a synonym, use a word in a sentence. And then when um, they feel like they've mastered it, they indicate that on the sheet. So. In your handouts, you have a um, worksheet to go along with this that you can just print out or you can have students write this in um, their folders or keep it digitally wherever they keep the most important vocabulary that they are working on for that unit. Um, hopefully these are tier two, tier three vocabulary words that go along with your content, your academic language. But the goal is for them to not only um, know the word, but be able to read the word and use um, the meaning of the word in their own words, their own language. And hopefully this is something that they can keep up with all year, just as an ongoing folder of the vocabulary that they learn in your classroom. I Know You Know is uh, found on page 21 of your handouts. For this strategy, you're going to place students in groups of three or four, and hopefully that those students will have a variety of uh, reading abilities. So you don't want all your high students together. You don't want all your low readers together. You want them with um, a variety of ranges so that they can help each other out in the conversation and learn from each other. You provide them with the um, text and then a copy of the graphic organizer as well, and you ask them to skim and read silently before they share information about the article. Um, then you ask them to discuss and record what they've learned. They will. Um, and I take the text as they go, and um, then the group, as a group, they decide what is most important. So it, it's kind of like a KWL that is a group activity. What do you know at the beginning? Then they can share that. What do your classmates know? And if it's the same, they can just star that. But if your, the classmates added additional information, then they place it in that box. Then they read it, and, and what did we learn? And then they can also add what questions do we have about um, the article that we did not get answered, or what did it make me think of? I saw this strategy used in a classroom a couple weeks ago, and I love the questions that students came up with, and because it was linked to the content, but not covered in that classroom at all, and it made me think. Uh, about how how great it was that students were actually extending or trying to extend their knowledge. Um, the teacher would take those questions from uh, the questions that students still wanted to know about and threw them out to the class and said, okay, get on your phones, spend three minutes trying to find the answer to this, and it was kind of like a little challenge for the class 
but I, I love that it, it really helps the students relate to the content and build on the content. Socratic Smackdown is a really great strategy. You have the entire packet that goes along with this in your handouts. This is put out by the Institute of Play. I just took that packet from their website and you have a reference to their website here, and I pulled it into our handout so that you wouldn't have to go dig for it. This is an awesome strategy. What I really like about this strategy is it pulls in that argument piece that is in the ELA standards, and we are asked to move across disciplines and science, use science standards as well. But it helps um, to that debate piece in a fun game, but don't let the word game trick you. Um, they, the students will get points based on how well they do during this game. If they agree with someone and build on an argument, they get an extra point. If they use evidence to back up a statement they said, they get two points. If they distract the class, they get a point subtracted. So you team them up to have this argument and all of that is discussed in the handout. And then um, once they're teamed up, they'll debate a topic that they have read about and they will debate how best to answer um, that situation. So again, it needs to be a higher level question or situation that you, you throw out to them. Um, might be how would you treat this patient based on the information you read where they they have a debate about that, um, and then they gain points on how well they answer it based on the research that they did. So they will spend about, this strategy here takes the longest of any strategy that I gave you. It will take a little bit of practice on your part in terms of the classroom management, but once you do it a couple times, the students love it. They love the game part of it. They love the points and it really does train them to think in that argumentative way where they justify um, their answers and have to use evidence. So in a quick review, I know that we have just soared through a whole bunch of different strategies. I hope that um, you have some there that you can pull from, even if you just learned a couple today that you will utilize. I hope that they go well for you and I would absolutely love, love, love to hear about them after today and um, how you use them. And if you, even if you have any struggles with them, please reach out to me and I will help you think through that. In review, think about the reading material you give students. Is it relevant? If it is not relevant, if it's not interesting, then how can you change that so that it can be? And then consider the questions you ask students to go along with that text. Are they high level rigor questions or are you training students to think at the low level rigor um, level? If you're training them to think at the low level rigor p level, you're probably going to see them tune out on your text because it just does not challenge them. And then um, also to use a variety of strategies to engage students. I've tried to dump a, a load on a load of strategies on you today so that you can um, have a virtual toolbox to pull from. I think the key to keeping students at the high school level engaged, one of the keys I should say, is is to use a variety of strategies so that they have a, a little variation in that classroom um, instruction. Okay, questions for me. I know that fast and furious hour. I, I love talking about literacy and get carried away on this topic, but does anyone have any questions for me as we wrap up today? Okay, Sherry, if there aren't any questions right this second. We'll give attendees um, maybe, you know, a minute or so to, th to think up some if they have any. Um, and I will read them out loud if they come in. If not, we will wrap up. Okay, and so they have a section to type those in the right hand part, right? Yep, I'd, yep. On the control panel, there's a box to type in questions. And then I'm also putting my contact information up as you consider if you have any questions or not. And again, I would love to hear from you after today as far as which strategies you used and how successful they were. If you use these in your class and you're on Twitter, 
definitely post those. I would love to see those and even tag me there um, so that I can see that you're utilizing those. We want to make these webinars as friendly and as useful as possible to our teachers and administrators. And um, if they are not, then we definitely want to alter them so they are for you. Okay, it doesn't seem like we have any questions, Sherry. <clears throat> okay, great. Thank you everyone for joining us today and I hope you can join us in our next webinar as we talk about um, project-based learning. <laughs> great, thank you, Sherry. On behalf of the Technical Assistance Center, thank you to Sherry for her presentation and thank you to our attendees for joining us. As a reminder, this presentation was recorded and will be posted on nyctecenter.org.